This is lesson 5.1, representing patterns. This is the first lesson of chapter five, which is about linear relations, which essentially is just about a bunch of different patterns. We can summarize patterns in a table of values. So we've got our X and Y values, and we can notice the patterns based on how much the values are going up. So in the first example, all of the X values are going up by one each time, and the Y values are going up by two each time. For the other example, the Xs are going up by five, and the Ys are going down by one. We can use these like up and down movements to calculate what's called the rate of change. The rate of change is how one variable changes in relation to another variable. In other words, how are the Xs changing, how are the Ys changing, and how do these relate to each other? So for example, if we're looking at buying pizza, we have a base cost of $5, and then for each topping that we add to the pizza, the price goes up by 50 cents. So we represent that in this table here based on the number of toppings and the total cost for the pizza. We can use this example to calculate rate of change. The first step is you're going to calculate how much the first variable is increasing or decreasing each time. So this is the first variable, and we can see clearly that it's increasing by one each time. Then we want to calculate the same thing for the second variable. So as we're going up in the second variable, it's increasing by 50 cents, or 0 0.5. It's important to note that if the values are increasing, then it's going to be positive, because it's being added every time. But if the values are decreasing, then it's going to be negative. So like this example here, the, um, the X's are going up by five and the Y's are going down by one. So those would be the values that you have here. Then to calculate the rate of change, you divide the second value by the first value. So what we've done here, we know that the first column or the first value is increasing by one. The second value is increasing by 0.5. And so to get the rate of change, we divide the second value by the first value. So 0 0.5 divided by one, I mean, that's nice and easy. It just leaves us with 0.5. So the rate of change for this situation with buying a pizza is 0 0.5. Why is this useful? Because this represents that it costs 0 0.5 or 50 cents per topping. So this is a very basic example. It might not be as clear why rate of change is useful, but we can, what we've just found is the relationship between how much the cost is changing compared to how much the number of toppings are changing. How are those related to each other? So example, we don't have context here. We just have X's and Y's in our table of value, but let's calculate the rate of change. So the first step is to calculate how much are the X's increasing or decreasing by. When we look at the table, we can see that we're going down by two each time. So they are decreasing by two. We'll do the same thing for the second variable, the y's. As we go down the table, they are increasing by three. So the rate of change is whatever you got for the second value divided by whatever you had for the first value. So three divided by negative two. It's important to remember that negative two because remember the x's are decreasing. If a value, if, we're, if the value we're looking at is decreasing, then it's negative. If the value we're looking at was increasing, then it's positive. So overall, the rate of change is three over negative two. That represents the relationship, like how are the X's changing in relation to how the Y's are changing and vice versa. Another important piece to understand linear relations is a fixed term or the starting value. What this means is the value of the second variable Y when the first variable X is zero. So the starting value is like whenever x is zero, the corresponding y value, that's where it starts. It's not necessarily the first x listed in the table. That's a really important note to consider. We'll go over a couple examples to make it clear. So with the pizza example we already talked about, we know looking at the table of values that with zero toppings, a pizza still costs $5. So if I scroll up again, this is our table. The starting value in, would be $5 because that's when the first variable or the X variable is zero. The corresponding Y value is five. So the starting value is $5 in this case. 
it makes sense in this context as well because remember it's called a fixed term this is the term that doesn't change it's fixed because it will never change you always have to pay that five dollar initial fee regardless of how many toppings you have so you, regardless even if you had no toppings on your pizza you're paying five dollars and then when you add toppings to it you get a you get charged another 50 cents each time so your fixed term or your starting value is five dollars in that pizza example Let's try a couple other examples to see when it gets a bit more complicated. In this first table of values, okay, the starting value is when x or the first variable equals zero. So that's easy to find because we see the first one there shows us when x is zero. We know that y is 100. So 100 is the starting value. That's easy because x equals zero is given to us. But in the second example, we don't have x equals zero here. It starts at five and goes up. So a very important thing to know is that some people might say, oh, the starting value is the first thing, so therefore it's 20. But that's not true because the starting value or the fixed term is when x equals zero, when that first variable equals zero. And so although it's not on this table now, we can find it by kind of continuing the pattern backwards. So we don't currently see x equals zero, so extend the pattern backwards until you find it. So in blue, we have the information we already know, the table we already know, and we know that the x's are going up by five each time. So to get the, the value that would have come right before it, we just minus five. Same thing with the y's. We know that they're going up by 10 each time. So to get the value before it, we'll subtract 10. We basically just created another point in this table that continues the pattern that already exists. And once we've done that, we do get zero in our table. We do get an x value of zero. And the corresponding y value is 10. So therefore, the starting value is 10. Same thing for this example, and this is actually one directly from your homework. We have our table of values, but we don't have x equals zero. In order to find the starting value, we need to find when x equals zero. So we can do this by extending the pattern backwards. In blue, we have the information that we're already given. So I've kind of inserted a, a line here to figure out that next or the row that would have come before it. The x's are going up by four each time. So if I just subtract this term here by four, then I would get to zero and I'll be on the right track to finding my starting value. The same thing with the y's, they're going up by 20. So if I just take this first thing and subtract 20, it'll bring me to the, the point that would have come before. So therefore, the starting value is seven because that's the y value when x equals zero. Sometimes you might have to extend it maybe once or twice to get to that first starting value, but that's all you have to do is extend the pattern to find it. So why, are, why is this helpful? Why do we learn about rate of change and this starting value? Because patterns can be represented in equations. Linear equations look like this. I've started in red because this is a really, really important formula that represents linear equations and linear relations that you will be using for the rest of your high school math career and onwards if you do more math. So what all these pieces represent? We've got our y and we've got our x. So we already know that when we have our table of values, the x is the first term or the first variable and the y is the second variable. Those don't change too often because we'll, those all, we'll, more so those change all the time. So we don't need to find a specific value for it right now because those will change for every row of your table of values. But the A and the B, that's what we need to focus on right now. The A here, which is getting multiplied by the X, represents the rate of change. So we already talked about rate of change. Um, that goes right here in the formula. You might also see it called the coefficient or the numerical coefficient. And because of the last chapters in three and four, we know what a coefficient means. It means the value or the number in front of the variable. And so that makes sense as well why that's the rate of change why the rate of change is the coefficient, because it's the value in front of the variable x. B is the fixed term or starting value that we were just talking about. And you also might see it be called the constant, which we also know from our last chapters, a constant is a number just on its own. So how can we use this? Well, let's go back to our pizza, pizza example and write an equation to represent that situation. So A represents the rate of change, which we already found to be 0.5. And B represents the fixed term, which we already found to be five, because remember the initial cost of a pizza is $5, even if you don't have any toppings on it. 
We already know what our variables represent. X was the first thing, the number of toppings, and Y was the cost. So if we put this into a, an equation, this is what we're gonna get. We only replace the A and the B values because X and Y change each time. So you're gonna have your Y equals AX plus B, and then sub in what you found for A and what you found for B. So our rate of change is 0 0.5, and our uh, fixed term is five. So this equation represents the cost of the pizza and how many toppings exist. This is helpful because we can use this equation to calculate the cost of a pizza with any number of toppings. Because remember, X represents the number of toppings, Y represents the cost. So let's use this equation to figure out how much a pizza costs with eight toppings. We already have our equation here. Substitute X equals eight, because we've got eight toppings, and solve. When we replace X with eight, we get 0.5 times eight plus five. Well, 0.5 times eight gives us four. When we add five to that, we get nine. We have a therefore statement. We have a word answer for our word question. So therefore, the pizza would cost $9. Another example, let's say your phone plan costs $30 a month, and then for your data plan, every 100 megabytes that you use, it costs you $2. So create a table of values and an equation to represent this. So you're given, uh, you're given the table here, the first variable is gonna be the number of 100 megabyte packages of data you used, and then the other second variable will be the cost. Okay, well, we'll start with zero. How much would it cost us each month for our phone plan if we use no data? It would cost us $30 because that's the initial starting amount, $30. And then as we go up one, two, three, depending which counts for like how many packages we purchase, the cost will go up by $2 each time because that's what the information given to us was. So the first variable is going up by one. The second variable is going up by two. Our table of values is finished we need to make an equation to represent this as well. So let's first find the rate of change or our A value. Rate of change is how much the second variable is increasing, two, divided by how much the first variable is increasing, which is one. So overall, our rate of change is just two. We know that B or the starting value is $30 because that's the value when our X term or our first variable is zero. With these two values, we can put them together in a two-hour equation, replace A with two, replace B with 30. So Y equals 2X plus 30 represents the cost of your phone plan based in relation to how much data you used. Another example here. So we're given a table of values, determine an equation to represent this data. So the first thing we're gonna do is find our rate of change. When we look at the table, we see that our X's are going up by two each time and our Y's are going down by 10 each time. The rate of change is how much the Y's are changing, remember to keep that negative because they're decreasing, over how much the X's are changing, which would be positive two. Negative 10 over two just simplifies to negative five, so negative five is our rate of change. To find the starting value, we need to know when does X equal zero? That's not given in the table that we have, so we need to extend our table backwards by extending the pattern to figure out what value is y when x equals zero. So if we just add one more row, we're gonna kind of subtract by two and then add by 10, we're doing the pattern backwards, and we find out that the starting value is, oops, I put 10, it should be 110, because that is when x equals zero. Oh, I don't want it in green either. So the starting value is 110, 110, 110. So once we know our A value and our B value, we just sub it into our equation by replacing the A and B with those two values there. The last part of this lesson is the difference between continuous data or discrete data. So continuous data is when all values between the maximum and the minimum are possible. So all decimals, half values, everything counts. So an example would be if you were asked like how much rain has fallen. It could be anywhere between, depending on, I don't know, the day or the week, anywhere between zero millimeters and 70 millimeters, let's say. And every value in between could be the amount of rain that has fallen. 
So for example, maybe 10.56 millimeters exactly was what fell. It's not only 10 millimeters or only five millimeters. It can be any decimal point in between. Discrete data, on the other hand, is it only includes certain values between the max and the min. Only some of them are possible. So for example, if I asked what grades are the students in at Kitsilano, the only options are eight, nine, 10, 11, or 12. No in between. I can't say that you're in grade eight and a half or 9.6. It's discrete because only those options are possible. Another example of discrete data would be like how many people are in the room? Maybe there's two people or five people or 10 people, but you're not gonna say there's you know, six and a half people in the room. You can't have halves, you can't have decimals. It's very discrete how many or which values are allowed for that context. So that is how we represent patterns, how we can create tables of values or equations for linear relations, calculate our rate of change or starting values too, and the difference between continuous and discrete data.